much to my horror, it's taken me a really long time um, to work on this current project. Um, and part of the horror for me is that the first book uh, continues to exist while I'm working on this one. Uh, and in many ways, the first book project is now so far away from my own ideological commitments um, and intellectual interests that it's hard for me to have that out there in the world as a thing representing me. Um, but as I've moved on to the new project, which is a project about African-American women's emotional lives and politics, um, the reason it's taken me a long time is in part a set of questions about epistemology, questions that I really didn't have as a young graduate student, young assistant professor coming out of graduate school, where I felt much more set about what my epistemologies were and what my um, tools were. So the first has to do with this question of black girls and math. Now I have uh, Condi here, um, in part because Condi Rice is maybe the most famous black woman political scientist in the country, although, is Condi here? Is she? No, she's not. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, she might have been. I mean, she, she's out of a job, right? I mean, what? She doing anything? I don't know. Um, so, um, so, so for me, part of it has to do with a basic challenge around our profession, right? The profession of uh, political science. So when I joke about us being one of, or you sort of a handful of maybe two handfuls of African American women in political science. Um, part of that has at least something to do with the particular approaches of political science as a field, particularly quantitative research. Uh, and so just as someone who over the past decade has spent time training graduate students, uh, there's a pretty strong trend that African American women graduate students tend to stay away from quantitative training. Now a lot of times they will describe this desire to, hey, I didn't know, hey, um, part of the reason um, they will stay away from this um, quantitative training, they'll make a, a sort of intellectual claim about it, right? That the work that I'm doing um, does not appropriately lend itself uh, to quantitative work. But of course, they're saying this in their first year when they have no work that they're doing, um, when what they're doing at this point is taking classes and reading books. So the avoidance is sometimes about sort of the group of people who are teaching it, the tall men talking in the room. Um, sometimes it has to do with a set of math phobias that occurred very early on, and sometimes it does have to do with a set of intellectual rejections of quantitative research. But the problem is that on the job market, political scientists are disproportionately rewarded for quantitative work. All political scientists are disproportionately rewarded, including the white boys, right? So um, I will go to job talks, and in part because quantitative research is, and, and, and and particular kinds of math-oriented quantitative research represents um, sort of a foreign language um, or, or, an, or a foreign accent, right? And one that is very highly uh, rewarded, um, one that people like, and one that people barely understand. So um, when you're speaking in numbers talk, in math language, it can be a lot of smoke and mirrors and dogs and ponies and people feeling as though you are really quite smart and incredibly deep when you are neither one of those things. Um, but, but, the, but the power of quantitative work on the job market is to disproportionately reward folks who do it, and maybe most importantly to disproportionately reward African American women's bodies who do it. So little black girls who can do math in public, in political science conferences, are, you know, like, you know, dogs that can walk on their hind legs and sing the Star Spangled Banner. We are unusual and unlikely and no one expects us to be able to do it. Uh, and it can it sometimes be as much a trick as a real tool. So there's a lot of anxiety around these set of rare resources um, that folks on the one hand don't want to invest in the training, in part because they have a set of intellectual angst right, against it, but that we have a situation where those who do invest in it are disproportionately rewarded and therefore end up with positions in the profession um, that are maybe higher or better enumerated, remunerated at least, um, than other folks. So the question is, in this particular situation, what constitutes uh, sort of an act of intellectual resistance? What is the feminist, uh, black feminist path that one might take? Is the approach to actually become uh, a quantitative researcher and therefore to show that in fact dogs can walk on their back legs in a tutu and sing the Star Spangled Banner? Um, 
or that in fact we are not those things, but that we are uh, political scientists, that we are scholars, that we are all of the things that our white male colleagues can be, or is the act of resistance to say, in fact, we don't need the master's tools, we are building a different kind of house, and we're going to make a claim towards our capacity to be serious scholars without measuring ourselves by your particular um, yardstick. And, and I'd leave that open uh, as a question. On the other side, right, in addition to the question of sort of black women and math, there's also this question of black women as subjects of political science, the things that constitute our politics. So I have Mammy here in part because I was spending a lot of time with Mammy this summer, um, as, as well as with Jezebel and with others, as I've been trying to think through these questions of um, African American women's images and the politics of how black women are represented. And so again, the big question for me as someone who engages in a lot of empirical research um, is what kind of empirical research is appropriate for doing the work on African American women's lives? Can black women be appropriately studied using quantitative methods? Can we measure the impact of MAMI on our lives? Is there some yardstick, some ruler, some regression that can tell us the work that she is doing for us politically? I mean, in this sense, does measurement itself deny the internet intersectional experience? Anyone who does, you know, sort of public opinion quantitative work knows that intersectionality and quantitative work has meant little more than using multiple dummy variables. And the very language of dummy variable, of course, is funny here because it's stupid. Um, so when you want to study black women, what you do is you put in the race dummy and the gender dummy, um, and then you get a double dummy in order to do intersectional work. Uh, and of course, you know, again, those of us committed to an epistemology around black feminism recognize that double dummying is not what we mean by the intersections of race and gender. So, and yet, right, is there some way in which we might think that African American women, in fact, deserve to be taken seriously um, as subjects of quantitative study? In other words, to the extent that we think of quantitative research within the limitations of the field of political science as at least one of the gold standards of what constitutes really taking a subject seriously, then don't we deserve, right, as subjects of political science to be taken seriously in the same ways that, for example, Congress or the presidency or policymaking is taken seriously? Okay, so just super quickly, um, just to show you uh, how I have struggled uh, with this, I'm just going to show you a couple of quick examples from my work. Um, the first one just makes me laugh because Rod Blagojevich is on the slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is just a little bit of research from the Expo for Today's Black Woman. Some people in the audience actually helped to collect the data for this. Um, it's a little survey where we went out and we asked black women who were at this um, Expo for Today's Black Woman. Do you guys have this in your town? The Expo for Today's Black Woman, right? Um, so uh, we figured that the Expo for Today's Black Woman is a really great place to find African American women who are thinking about themselves as black women, right? They're actually thinking of themselves um, at this um, intersection. So we went out with these little surveys and they were um, just surveys where we asked uh, African American women to describe themselves using three words, to describe white women using three words, to describe black men using three words, and to describe white men using three words. Um, and then looked at the results. And the reason I'm showing you this slide is because it's one that has become for me both my most favorite slide um, in uh, the new book project as well as the one which every time I show it uh, freaks out audiences. So um, I enjoyed this slide. So these are the results from the expo for today's black woman. Um, and remember the central thesis that I've got going on in this book has to do with African American women thinking of themselves within the construct of the strong black woman. So I just want to walk you through this slide real quick so you can see how much I love uh, and how disturbed people are with this slide. So if you look at how African American women are talking about themselves, they're describing themselves as strong, beautiful, smart, independent, kind, and loving, right? So these are a lot of numbers up here, but even for those of you who don't read numbers, you catch right away that the way that African American women describe themselves is very much in line with the very traditional notion of the strong black woman, right? They're strong, beautiful, smart, independent, kind, and loving. By the way, they describe African American men very similarly, right? As strong, handsome, smart, powerful, kind, loving, and determined. But because numbers are cool, I want you to see that all, along this very bottom row, black women, 54%, uh, so maybe you can't see, so I'll just tell you out loud, 54% of all the responses 
Now, we're going out asking hundreds of black women this question. We're not giving them any words. We're letting them think up their own words. 55% of all the responses are in the categories strong, beautiful, smart, independent, kind, and loving. So it's a very tight description, right? About half of all responses fit into those top categories. But you'll see that for black men, although that description is about the same, only about 40%, right, 38% of, of the descriptions fit into that. And I can tell you that what happens after these top categories is a lot more negative. Right, so the top categories are still the same, but it's a much less tight definition. Uh, let's jump over to white men real quick, because white men are actually pretty tightly defined as well, actually more tightly defined than um, black men, as aggressive, rich, dishonest, arrogant, mean, and powerful. And then my most favorite um, in terms of making this argument that I like to make is the description of white women as passive, stupid, dishonest, arrogant, and privileged. Passive, stupid, dishonest, arrogant, and privileged. Now, I, this particularly freaks out white women when I show them this slide. <laughs> now, it freaks out white women for a lot of reasons, um, in part because I'm always, almost always giving this talk in front of white women who see themselves as friends of black women and they cannot comprehend why black women see them this way. Um, <laughs> It tends to freak out political scientists because in the, in the field of political science, we actually only ever ask white people what they think about black people. We rarely ever ask black people what they think about white people. So it's stunning to them to find out we, we're not like all striving to be them. Um, <laughs> and, I, and for me, part of what's very powerful here is that we're always sort of working on a set of anxieties about um, and, 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 have, and there's beautiful, brilliant historical work, sociological work about um, the difficulties that African American women and white women have in building cross-racial alliances around gendered questions. But the cool thing that I like about these particular numbers is that they also help us to see it numerically, right? There's this way in which this thing that we already know, this thing that we have in many ways traced historically, this thing in which we have a sense about looks like it in the uh, quantitative work. Now, that, that's not my, my bid for quantitative work. It's just my bid for why I do it. Um, because Not because it tells me something I didn't know already, but because there's something in particular about how it tells me or how it helps to inform what I know already uh, that I find useful. And so the very last thing on this slide and for this presentation is just the word strong is used to describe every other category of people, black women, black men, and white men, the only category where African American women never once use the word strong um, as a descriptive category is with white women. And so that alone becomes this kind of powerful result that I can then uh, kind of have a moment to talk about. All right. <laughs>